Minister Yolanda Pearl. Good morning, good morning, good morning. The word says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, amen. That is truly my heart. That is truly, truly my heart. So, um, whew, thank you. Thank you, Sister Lauren. Um, man, my heart is on fire right now. So I'm, I'm gonna get through, I promise, I promise. Um, whew. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for giving me this wonderful opportunity, um, man. And I, I, I count it an honor, amen. So I make a disclaimer that before I start, that this text may not answer all your questions about the storms we face in life, but it will give you tools to use to come out on the other side of the storm. Deuteronomy 29 and 29 says, the secret things belong unto Jehovah our God, but the things that are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So there are things that we will not be able to answer. And sometimes we will just have to say Deuteronomy 29 and 29. So, it's not gonna answer all the ifs and the what ifs, but I hope that this text, that is a familiar passage to some, it may be new to others, will help you in your process of as you're going through a storm. I believe that we are either headed for a storm, in the midst of the storm, or coming out of a storm. It is either one of those three things. And how you deal with it, it depends upon where you are in life and what is going on. Have you ever experienced a time in your life when you went through a situation, the type of life situation that had you crying, it was uncomfortable, couldn't see straight, and you realized at the end of it, on the other side of the situation, it worked for your good. You came out stronger, better, lighter, renewed, and gained more wisdom, but you couldn't see it in the storm that you were in. I tell God that, you know, you could have warned me or, or sent an express mail and I would have learned the lesson without all of the heartache and I didn't have to stay in it for that long. You know, Lord, you could have just told me. Well, in my conversation, God said, well, I did tell you. I did show you, but you were focused on the storm so you didn't hear me. And then I realized it was all a setup. So my lesson starts with, this is my text, it was all a setup. Our passage of scripture comes from Matthew, which is one of the gospels. And before we read it, I just want to set the scene for you so you can see how the biblical text starts. We're going to start off in Matthew 13, which shows Jesus had a teaching series on life lessons called the parables. It was here we were, he was engaging the people about the sower, the tares, the mustard seed of faith, and much more. But at the beginning of chapter 14, we find that his cousin John the Baptist was killed. He heard about it in the midst of all of this. And then at that time, I hope it sounds familiar, that John the Baptist was killed unjustly, unnecessary. But in the midst of it all, it was necessary because Jesus had to come on the scene. That's not my story today, but I just want to give you a little tidbit. So as we see that um, in this familiar passage where John the Baptist is killed, we also notice that even in today's time that people are killed unjustly by people who are in power. I'm going to let you sit in that. So once Jesus learned of this, Jesus was like, I need to go away. I need to go and grieve. I need to go talk to my father. So self-care in the midst of our trials and our storms is necessary. It is never okay just to push through. I know that we have in our lifetimes where we say, I'm just going to push through. I'm just hanging on. No, some of us just need to sit down and sit in the presence of God to be renewed. So as we see, Jesus starts to do this. But what happens? The multitude finds him. 
They're like, well, Jesus going over here, we come in. And so he had compassion on them. And Jesus being who Jesus was, he started to heal the sick and started to help them out. And then he realized that he needed that it was over, right? Because it was getting late in the hour. And the disciples, as the disciples are, you know, they said, you know, it's getting late. You got to send them home. It's time to go home. Isn't that like us in church? It's time for you to go home. Um, and so... Um, He tells the disciples, well, we can't send them home. We have to feed them. So he performs another miracle with five loaves and two fishes of bread. He feeds them, and then he disperses them. And what he does is he put the disciples on the boat, and we'll read that, and then he let the people go. And then he went into the mountains. And so if you will turn with me, you can read our scripture in Matthew 14, 22 to 32, and we're going to read it through the Passion Translation. Oh, I didn't know if it was up. Okay, here we go. As soon as the people were fed, (laughs) Jesus told his disciples to get in their boat and to go to the other side of the lake while he stayed behind to dismiss the people. After the crowds dispersed, Jesus went up into the hills to pray. And as night fell, he was there praying alone. But the disciples who were now in the middle of the lake ran into trouble. For their boat was tossed about by the high winds and heavy seas. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on the waves. When the disciples saw him walking on top of the water, they were terrified and screamed, a ghost. Then Jesus said, be brave and don't be afraid. I'm here. And there's always this one. Peter shouted out, Lord, it's really you that had me join you on the water. I'm coming. And he said, come on and join me, Jesus replied. Peter stepped down onto the water and began to walk toward Jesus. But when he realized how high the waves were, he became frightened and started to sink. And then he said, save me, Lord, he cried out. Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and lifted him and said, what little faith you have. Why would you let doubt win? As we look at our text, <laughs> there are more, there are so many points we can get from this story, but I'm only going to focus on the three. And remember, it's all a setup. So we're going to focus on one, Holy Spirit is always there walking with you. Two, focusing on the storm is a distraction that will produce fear. Three, it is time to get out of the boat. Mm. What we notice is that Prayer is essential in our lives as Christians, but especially in the storm of life. Prayer keeps us focused and grounded in God, even in the times we don't understand what is happening. Our text immediately shows Jesus dismissing the disciples on a boat and told the people, go home, while he went to grieve the loss of his cousin and commune with his father. During this time, the disciples get on the boat, ran into a storm, It is interesting to know who was on the boat with them. See, sometimes we're in the midst of the storm and we don't know who's in the boat with us. The boat represents the body of believers. Who is in the boat with you? People won't leave you astray. They'll be right there with you. That's why God hooked us up together. There was four men who were fishermen. They were Peter, Andrew, James, and John. It is important to note that being on the boat, they were able to handle the sea and confident to manage the storm they were in. So when you got some fishermen on the boat, all the seas, they know how to handle it. They got it. They, and everybody's on the boat. It's like, we're going to leave that to you. We, we, you got that just fine. In our storms in our lives, the person, the entity that can handle it is the Holy Spirit. It's not us. We don't have the strength, the aptitude. We don't have enough education. There's not enough experience that can lead us to go through something that we've never been through before. So we have to lean on the Holy Spirit. And how that happens, I know someone is going to say, well, how do I do that? It's in prayer (laughs) on Tuesdays at 6. Just want to put that in there. The biblical texts never mention them fearing the storm. There are times in our lives that the storm will come. There is no might to it. It will come. And the question is, how do you handle the storm? Have you ever heard of a mother that says, keep living? Just keep on. You'll see it after a while. 
while I do what I do. I had an old mother who would yell Jesus in the middle of nothing. We just going about our day and Jesus will be mentioned. There are times in our lives where Jesus, just the mention of the name of Jesus will change the trajectory of what's going on. I know some people say, well, you know, I can't um, quantify or qualify that. And I understand that. But I would say on the other side of the storm that it's through lived experiences that there are times that you will see, even now, if you look back over your life and you think about some stuff you put yourself into, you walked into, you ran to, I can guarantee you, you can say on some level that God was in the midst of that. I can guarantee you, you could say that, you know, if I really would have got in trouble for the stuff that I did, I would be in jail, underneath the jail, I would probably be dead, or I will not be here on today. But it was God in the midst of it. A storm represents the fires in Maui and the people they lost. The storms represent the reverse of affirmative actions at the college level. The storms represent people being robbed in their homes, cars, and just feeling unsafe. The storm represents sentiments by Jason Aldean in a small town. These are storms that are waking up and we are wondering where is God during these calamities? You may be angry, disappointed, and you cannot figure it out. It is a Western view to want answers when we don't have any. All I can say is that God knows. It is in these calamities that the Holy Spirit walks with us unapologetically. Let's make it personal, right? Our storms may be financial. Maybe health, maybe mental, maybe physical, maybe the situation you find yourself being unhoused or about to be unhoused. We live in California. Some of us is just a paycheck away from being homeless. Whatever you find yourself in, God is in the midst of that. And it's in that that God wants to meet you. So when we talk about the storms of life, remember I said that it is a setup. So your storm in your life will lead you to go closer to God or away from God. It's either this or that. And a lot of times as we walking in our relationship with God, we want the peaches and the roses. We want everything to be great. We want our lives to be great. We want our housing to be great. We want our finances to be great. We want everything in our lives to run smooth. And so we come up, we give our life to Christ. We come on Tuesday night. We may have got a healing, because some people did. We may have become whole, right? And then all of a sudden, life happens. The storm comes. And normally, the storm comes when we say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever you say. And then the storm says, all right, I got you. Here you go. And that is when what you said becomes not a test, but a setup for something better. See, some of us are saying, Lord God, I want more of. And God says, okay, I'm going to give you this. I want to learn how to love people correctly. So then he brings someone who's unlovable. You say, well, Lord God, I want to be great at my finances. And then your finances seem to not meet, the ends don't meet, right? And you're trying to figure it out. You're like, well, Lord, last year I had this same amount of money, but something ain't right. The math is not mathing. Um, my PG e went high. Um, my, my water bill seemed to have exploded and what's going on with Xfinity because they seem to have lost their mind and then now I got a cell phone bill and I'm like, what you say? I don't talk that much. And so as you begin to look at these things and you realize, Lord God, I asked you for it. So then you start to rein it on in. But how do you rein it on in? How do you begin to get to that point where you start to have wisdom. Well, there's not a cheat sheet for that. That comes in the presence of God. That comes in your prayer time. That comes in worship. 
that comes that no matter if the storms don't cease, my anchor is in you, Lord. It comes that no matter what I face, I still got you. So as we begin to look, Remember, we have our three. The Holy Spirit will always walk with you. Yes. You are never alone. Even in the midst when you feel alone, there are going to be seasons. I know that people say that there are tests, right? And they say, when you go to the test, you know, you, you take the test by yourself. Well, I don't know about you, but every time the test, you take a test, the test, the person who gave the test is always in the building. They never leave you, right? They in there with you, right? So even while you taking the test, <laughs> Jesus is always there. If you feel that Jesus is quiet and you say, I can't hear his voice. I don't know where I can find him. I tell you, come meet us on Tuesday. That's another plug. And we'll pray with you till you can hear. We'll worship with you till you can hear. We'll sit with you until you can hear because God is in the midst. So now we see all these things, all of these calamities, all everything that's happening. And as we make it personal, we realize that we are a community of believers that we will encourage each other along the way. So number two, we get to <laughs> don't focus on the storm. What do you mean? I am saying acknowledge the storm, okay? Don't be one of those people that say, I don't see it, okay? Because that will lead you into debt and it's not, it's not a happy place. Acknowledge the storm. You know it is there and there are situations that will not go away, but do not dwell on these situations. You help as best as you can and you keep your focus on Jesus. Peter began to sink only when he lost focus on Jesus. Could you imagine getting out of the boat and you walking on water and you all super excited and then all of a sudden you realize the wind has hit you and there's nothing underneath you and then you realize, I'm sinking. Story time. So in my infinite wisdom, I thought I was gonna take a swimming class because I wanted to learn how to swim. And someone said, if you learn how to swim, it helps you to lose weight, right? So I was like, oh, look, oh for sure, I'm about this life, I'm about to learn how to swim. <laughs> so I signed up for it, right? In my mind, because I took Shari to swim when she was little, I thought somebody would be with me and that they would help me across the thing, right? So I'm five feet, I'm only in four feet of water, so I could stand up. And somehow this person who was teaching us to swim told us to go across the water. I was like, what? <laughs> I need a floaty, I need some glasses. Like I'm ill prepared. Like I, I, and so I literally walked across the water because I was not swimming. I, I was just faking it. And, and a sister said, see, this is why it's nice for us to be in community. The sister said, you need a floaty. I said, I need a floaty? She said, yeah. Get the floaty. So she told the person, give me a floaty. And I'm trying to say, is this an entry level class that on the first day you got me going across the water without nothing? <laughs> I don't understand, yeah. right? And so this is, I can understand Peter walking on the water, right? So I get on the floaty and then I think I'm doing something because now I could go across the water, right? And I'm actually like swimming, like seriously, because I'm holding on to the floaty. And something in my mind made me realize, Yolanda, it is a floaty that's not even two pounds, and you put in more trust in the floaty to get you across the way. Isn't that like us today? We will put our trust in things that's not helping but we think it is to get us across the way. So one thing I've learned about swimming is that the water actually will support you if you relax. And then I realized, cause you know, I'm a plus size sister, and in my mind I felt like this water can't support me. I think it's wrong, 
right? Now, all of you who know science, because I'm not a great science person, will know, yes, Yolanda, it can. And I realize that it will, but it's my fear of the water is the reason why it can't. So when someone passes away in the water, it's usually because of fear. It's usually because they panicked. And those who are taught to help those who are drowning, they say, wait till they stop failing, flailing their arms, and wait till they calm down, because they'll take you with them. Yeah. There are some times we are in the water, and we can take other people with us. They will take us on a trip that we did not want to go on. My daughter taught me, uh, Nishari, she taught me a word, and she said, mama, this person is trauma dumping. I said, what? She was like, they just tr dumped all their trauma on you. I was like, really? I was like, trauma dumping. Sometimes we have the ability to trauma dump with people who do not have the ability to receive it. So we're actually talking to the wrong people. And then they'll turn around and take on our stuff along with their stuff and they're drowning. And then you have people who create boundaries. Somebody say boundaries. boundaries. And then they say, you know what, sis, I can't help you, but I think there's a therapist that might. And I think you need to go to the way and go on the website and get the free, uh, you know, people who can help you walk you through this process. And so as we start to see in this storm, and I realized in this water that it represents so much more because the storms of life will hit us. It is a guarantee, but we still have to get out the boat, which leads me to my third point, get out the boat. And you might say, well, what, what, what is the boat, right? Like, what does that represent? I don't understand. The boat is your ministry, get out of the boat and step on the water, the water is your ministry. Sometimes the boat can be a safe haven and sometimes it could just keep you from going where God wants you to go. Getting out of the boat, there is never a perfect time. I know some of you have businesses, have heart desires, you're waiting on that book that you're gonna write that can't write itself. Some of you are waiting to go to school, but it's never a great time. Some of you are wanting to go travel, but it's never a great time. There's never a great time to do anything that God has called you to do. So you just have to get out the boat. Now, I, I will admit that there is a likelihood of failure. See, we don't look at failure the same thing, right? In our westernized view, failure is a bad thing, right? And we're like, oh my God, I failed. They're gonna look at me, they're gonna say that. No, baby, that's just experience and keep going. Yeah. If you didn't fail, you wouldn't succeed the next time. Yeah, yeah. We have to normalize that it's okay if you tripped. It's okay if you sunk, because Peter did. Yes, did. And when Peter did, what did Peter do? He cried out to the Lord. Yes. Isn't that what we supposed to do? Is cry out to the God that we say we love, we say we serve, we say we for. Come on, come on. My Bible says that he will incline his ear and come and see about you. Yeah. God is just waiting on you. Yeah. You're waiting. Have you ever had somebody that you were waiting on and they was waiting on you? Everybody waiting. And it's always somebody going to say, what are we doing? <laughs> right? Well, where are we going? Right? Have you, ever, have you ever had that person, everybody waiting, like you're going to go out to dinner and, you know, everybody's dressed and you at church. Let's say it's after service and you at church and y'all decided y'all want to go out. All the friends is huddled in the same corner or the people who are going and everybody's looking like, so what are we doing? And it's always somebody that's going to say what we doing after five or 10 minutes, just standing there talking and chit chatting. And then they're like, are we really going to this? Yeah, we going. Well, when? Because I'm hungry, whatever, no parking. We got to get there. Whatever the situation is, right? Yeah. That's what God is doing to us. Yeah. What you waiting on? Come on, come on, come on, come on. What, what do you need? How can God meet the need? 
Remember, the Holy Spirit walks with you, yes. right? He said, he said he's walking with you, right? So if the Holy Spirit is watching you, walking with you, don't focus on the storm because our eye is supposed to be on Jesus, right? So if we're not focusing on, this, focusing on the situation, we're focusing on Jesus. So why you can't get out the boat? Why you can't get out the boat? And I say this because um, I think next week or in one of these weeks, we are having a ministry fair. It's time to get out the boat. And I will tell you that your ministry may not look what is offered. And you might say, well, my ministry looks a little different. And that is okay. Whatever it looks like, whether it's in the marketplace, whether it's here, God just wants you to get out the boat. Why? Because do you see the calamities that's outside? Somebody is waiting on your ministry. They're waiting on your word. They're waiting on your voice. They're waiting on your presence. But you still in the boat. So if you need someone to say, get out. If you need someone, say, activate. Holy Spirit, activate. If you need somebody to say it, I will say it to you all day. It's time to get out the boat. And then once you get out the boat, you realize it was all a setup. Thank you. Minister Yolanda, everybody. Come on, let's thank God for her great sermon, her great ministry.